I direct the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance at Stanford's Cyber Policy Center. Uh, as regulators and legislators at both the federal and state level uh, expand their uh, attention to cybersecurity with guidelines, rulemaking, and potential legislation, uh, they confront the question of how to enforce any standards uh, they pronounce. Uh, joining us today to talk about the various alternatives and their pros and cons is Jim Dempsey. Uh, Jim is a senior policy advisor to the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance, um, and a lecturer at UC Berkeley School of Law, where he teaches a course on cybersecurity law in the LLM program. Uh, until 2021, uh, Jim was the executive director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Uh, in 2012, after Senate confirmation, he served on the U.S. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. He graduated from Yale College and Harvard Law School and is the author of Cybersecurity Law Fundamentals, published by IAPP in 2021, with a new edition on its way at some point, uh, hopefully soon. This is a fast-changing area, as Jim will describe. Um, our run of show is Jim is going to uh, present, um, and we will leave uh, some, some time at the end for questions. So please get your questions uh, ready. Uh, be thinking about questions as Jim works his way through his presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Super. Andy, thanks so much. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, a great pleasure to be um, associated with the Stanford uh, Cyber Policy Center. Um, Always a great privilege to even just walk around this campus. I hope um, all of you actually spend a little time looking around and uh, realizing what, uh, what, what, what you're in the midst of, both intellectually as well as environmentally. Um, I'm going to talk for about um, half an hour, and then uh, I'm very eager to hear what Andy has to say. Uh, this is very much a work in progress that I'm going to be reporting to you on and uh, interested as well in all of your questions and your feedback. Because some of you might not be that familiar with the cybersecurity area, I'm going to spend about um, 10 or 15 minutes really in setup, in sort of getting us to where I think we are in terms of uh, government regulation of cybersecurity, uh, and then uh, 15, 20 minutes in terms of where I think we need to go and uh, trying to figure out sort of a, an effective and viable path forward. Uh, believe it or not, this is what Twitter looked like in uh, 2009. Um, Barack Obama in January of 2009 uh, was president-elect, uh, waiting to be inaugurated. Uh, he had used Twitter uh, during the campaign. He had a, a Twitter account. And in early January, this um, tweet appeared in his uh, feed, uh, offering people the possibility to win $500 in free gas if they participated in a survey. This was a, a fake. Um, somebody had hacked into the Twitter uh, system. They had um, actually used an automated uh, password guessing uh, tool to uh, submit thousands of guesses to an administrative uh, account at uh, Twitter. Uh, they weren't locked out after repeated false attempts. They finally did uh, find a password that let them into the system. They then uh, reset uh, numerous other passwords including uh, for Barack Obama's account, and posted this. Later on in um, 2009, Twitter actually had a, a second uh, breach, a very similar. A hacker was able to guess uh, the administrative password of a Twitter employee and use that to um, access and uh, reset uh, passwords of at least one Twitter user. The Federal Trade Commission is, was in 2009 and remains to this day the de facto national privacy and cybersecurity enforcement agency. Long story about how they got there, long story about how they took two words from the 1930s, um, unfair and deceptive uh, trade practices, four words I guess, unfair and deceptive and turned it into a privacy and cybersecurity regulatory mandate, but they did. And they opened an investigation into this particular incident because personal information had been compromised. In 2010, they filed a complaint and in, uh, and in that complaint, they alleged 
uh, basically that uh, Twitter had not set up adequate controls, particularly over admin access accounts. They found that uh, a large percentage of Twitter employees, in fact, in the early days of Twitter, every single employee had full admin access to everything on the network. And even as the company grew, many, many employees had uh, admin access that allowed them to get deep into the network. And Twitter, as most companies did and still do, settled the case. It entered into an agreement with the FTC, and the FTC issued a decision in order against uh, Twitter in which it required the company to take a variety of measures to improve its cybersecurity posture, including addressing the um, password management uh, practices and the practice of um, very loose uh, granting of administrative privileges to a wide range of employees who didn't need them. Fast forward 11 years, 2022, the um, Chief Information Security Officer of Twitter, a highly respected um, cybersecurity professional, um, goes by the uh, screen name or online name of Mudge, uh, quit, uh, blew the whistle, filed a complaint in which he uh, said that Twitter had never been in compliance with the 2011 FTC consent order and was not on track to ever comply with this order, including not fixing the very problem that had led to the Barack Obama attack, that had led to the 2010 uh, order. Uh, still, as of 2022, half of Twitter employees were given uh, access to sensitive production systems and user data beyond their, their, the need uh, to, do their, to do their job. This wasn't the only uh, example, it's not the only example of significant sort of failure of cybersecurity enforcement. The Department of Defense, since 2016, effective 2017, has been requiring uh, many of its contractors to comply with a NIST standard, NIST Special Publication 800-171, out a variety of information control measures. The Department of Defense has been requiring everybody who submits a bid on a government contract to say we are in compliance with NIST uh, 800-171. And then when they get, if they are awarded the contract, the contract documents include a clause saying we hereby commit to comply with NIST 800-171. Uh, survey in um, uh, last year, late last year, uh, found that uh, most defense contractors were not compliant, that only 13% of defense contractors could even claim on their own self that they had a score of 70 on a compliance test in which a, a full compliance was 110. So with 110 being um, uh, full compliance, um, 87 percent of contractors were less than 70, uh, only 13 percent, more than, more than 70. So this poses the question of sort of how are we going to enforce? Now for much of our sort of modern history, this was not an issue uh, because except for the FTC and except for a few other exceptions, defense contractors being one, the policy of the U.S. government had been we will not regulate the cybersecurity of the private sector. That president after president, administration after administration has issued policy statements saying we will collaborate, we will cooperate, we will engage in partnership, but we will not regulate. And as you can see, this has been across party, across administrations. Um, calling for collaboration, voluntary measures, but no mandate. And Congress, uh, this, is, this is all from the executive branch, 
Congress was the same. Congress has passed multiple statutes in the past 10 or 15 years with the word cybersecurity in the title and purporting to address cybersecurity. And every single one of them contains a clause like this one, basically saying, uh, in this case, the Secretary of Homeland Security, um, we are granting them no authority to promulgate rules or standards for the private sector. National Cybersecurity Protection Act of 2014, National Cybersecurity Protection Advancement Act of 2015, 2018, no regulatory authority. Now, that began to change radically in 2021. Um, early on the morning of uh, May 7th, 2021, attackers from the um, dark side uh, ransomware group uh, posted a notice on the internal computer system of Colonial Pipeline um, saying that they had uh, frozen uh, the computers and demanding uh, payment of ransom in order to unlock the computers. Um, Colonial Pipeline runs two sets of parallel uh, pipelines in various feeders. Uh, 5,500 miles in total, carrying uh, home heating oil, jet airplane fuel, um, uh, automobile, uh, gasoline. Fascinating. You can actually push different grades of uh, petroleum through this pipeline in, in sort of segments. Um, major, major element of the U.S. critical infrastructure. By 6:10 in the morning on May 7th, Colonial had shut down the entire uh, pipeline. Uh, stopping the flow of uh, petroleum products throughout uh, the east coast of the United States. Um, the following day, they paid $4.3 in uh, ransomware, and uh, it took them an additional um, four days to restart the flow of petroleum. This, I think, was, was a, uh, a tipping point. The, uh, soon thereafter, the... Transportation Security Administration, which of course runs the checkpoints at airports, they also have regulatory authority under existing law. It cites uh, here authority, uh, Title 49, ex United States Code. They had authority and they began issuing a series of directives. Uh, Congress has now, just uh, in legislation signed by President uh, Biden uh, uh, just before uh, the new year, uh, adopted or granted the Food and Drug Administration express authority to regulate the cybersecurity of medical devices. By my reading, this is the first legislation since 2005 that has expressly granted any federal agency authority uh, to regulate the cybersecurity of any private sector entity. Again, all of that public-private cooperation and voluntary measures had been the uh, byword for uh, cybersecurity policy of the United States across administrations for, for 20 years now. But we see Congress granting regulatory authority over medical devices, which are, of course, increasingly software-based and increasingly connected and therefore increasingly vulnerable. The average hospital has tens of thousands of medical devices that are connected to the Internet in one way or the other. And obviously, there are a number of people walking around with uh, pacemakers that are basically uh, software uh, software-based pacemakers. And we're expecting any day now a, uh, a new cyber strategy from the Biden administration, which is expected to call for the first time ever in, in this history of cybersecurity uh, national policy going back to the Clinton administration uh, in the last millennium. <laughs> um, first time ever uh, a call by the president we're expected to see uh, in the uh, uh, Biden administration cybersecurity strategy. So, <laughs> if we're going to regulate, how do we regulate? I published an article uh, last fall looking at uh, three different models. There are, I didn't really look at information disclosure, but we, we all get those notices of data breach and legislation has been passed and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has a rule on that. So we're seeing more and more uh, requirements of disclosing breaches. And now we're moving to beyond information disclosure to actually reg regulation of the technology. 
and I talked about means-based um, uh, regulation. You shall establish multi-factor authentication on all accounts or all customer accounts or all sensitive accounts or something like that. So you must use multi-factor authentication. Performance-based, which is actually very, very hard in cybersecurity because it's very hard to define outcomes, which is you must prevent unauthorized access. You know, there's a, there's a, perf a performance-based rule on motor vehicles. The brakes on a motor passenger car traveling 20 miles an hour, it must stop within 20 feet. That's the rule. That's the law. Every car brake, 20 miles an hour, stop within 20 feet. They don't say what the brake has to, how it has to work. It doesn't say how many brakes have to be on the car. It doesn't say what the brakes have to be made of. It, but it has an outcome which is measurable. Hard to measure that in the context of cybersecurity. And then management-based approaches, which are you must have a plan. Your plan must address this following factors, uh, access control, uh, patch management, um, vulnerability uh, management, et, et cetera. But again, not really saying how you must do it, but saying you must have a plan. Those are the three or four approaches. All of them depend on uh, regulation, I I enforcement. All of them depend on enforcement. And so the question then becomes, how do you enforce a regulatory standard? Whatever it is, whether it's means-based, performance-based, um, management-based, how do you enforce that rule? And there are roughly six means. There may be more. I'd be interested to hear Andy, um, Alex, others' uh, thoughts on additional ways to do this. But um, private litigation, which is sort of, in a way, the dominant approach we have now. Uh, it's a blunt instrument. It's retrospective. It's not forward-looking. And it's not sy systematic. Same with case-by-case -case regulatory enforcement. What the FTC did with Twitter, what it's done in about 80 or maybe now close to 100 cases over the past 20 years, bringing after the fact, post hoc, enforcement actions against entities. But um, put those aside for a minute because, again, they are backwards looking, they are not systematic, and both private litigation and FTC enforcement always results in a settlement of the case, which means there's actually no finding of wrongdoing. There may be steps saying, well, now you'll change this, but there's no real linkage often between what went wrong and what's ordered in the future, and they're negotiated case by case, and so it really gives you no certainty, no clarity, um, no sort of generalizable insight. Four other ways, self-certification, third-party audits, government review of plans, again, you sub must submit your plan to the government, and government supervision, inspection, or monitoring. So for the rest of the presentation, let me talk about what those are and um, pros and cons of each. Um, cybersecurity uh, self-certification has uh, been tried. Um, NIST, this, this particular uh, handbook has now been withdrawn and replaced by another effort. So this Def Department of Defense uh, requirement that says every defense contractor handling what's called classified uh, and unclassified uh, confidential but unclassified government information every government contractor that gets information from the government in the course of performing a, a contract must have processes in place to protect that information NIST issued a self-assessment handbook and the whole system has up till now, been based upon self-assessment. And it was widely recognized, as that survey that I mentioned found, that most contractors were actually not in compliance. They were getting away with it because they said, well, we are not in compliance, but we have a plan of action and milestones in order to get compliant. And so the government continued to give contracts to people who either said they were compliant, but the government didn't look to see if they were, 
or they admitted they weren't compliant, but they said, don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. And they were getting contracts repeatedly year after year. Uh, several uh, inspector general reports by the Department of Defense inspector general, this from 2019, looking at 10 specific uh, contractors and finding um, across the board many, many deficiencies in their um, uh, the D Inspector General repeated this in uh, 2021 uh, or 2022 with another group of contractors, same set of findings. Now, there is one tool that the government can use in conjunction with self-certification, and that is something called the False Claims Act. The False Claims Act makes it a crime to submit a claim for payment to the government that is false. It's a, probably a hundred year old statute, if not longer. Um, and basically it's a, it's, it's a crime to bilk the government on a, on a contract. And if you are committed to submitting a secure system and you don't, and you still submit an invoice under the contract, that's, that's a false claim against the government and can be criminally prosecuted. The sort of enforcement cycles of the Fraud and Abuse Act have uh, gone through waves of uh, troughs and peaks, but the Biden administration uh, announced, um, I think last year, a major initiative to increase false claim enforcement, specifically against contractors who falsely claim to be compliant. And there's a very interesting tool where a whistleblower can bring a case in essence, on behalf of the government and get a share of the penalty, actually, which is a nice motivator for someone in-house who's pissed off and has been hammering and saying, no, we're not compliant, not compliant. And the, the, the salespeople have been saying, no, but let's submit the certification anyhow, submit the certification anyhow. Let's just keep going. We need this contract. That security person can bring a claim and uh, ultimately it's taken over by the government, but the uh, individual can share. So potentially that works for government. It doesn't work so well for the 90% of critical infrastructure, um, pipelines, uh, electricity, telecoms, hospitals, transport, food, um, that is privately owned, the entire system, all of those infrastructures are privately owned and operated. Um, now, another approach is third-party audits, and I put third-party here in um, quotes. <sighs> There's actually a remarkable sort of disagreement or unclarity around the notion of third-party audits. Strictly speaking, you think about, let's say, a bank, which is the regulated entity. A bank has an internal audit department unit. It has its own employees who are double checking everything and who sort of serve that internal audit. Everybody agrees that's a first party audit. You're auditing yourself. Very important in many cases. Um, it, it sort of works into a lot of corporate governance, risk management uh, structures. First party. Second party, um, to my mind, a classic second party is where the bank, let's say, regulates its cloud provider. The bank doesn't run its own uh, servers. It outsources that to a third party cloud provider, but the bank will insist on the ability to audit its cloud provider and all of its other suppliers and says, we won't do business with you. We're not going to trust our data to you unless we can look inside your system. That's a classic second party audit. The bank is forcing the, the, the supplier, the bank may be hiring. It sends out either its own employees or it hires a contractor to go to the supplier and to audit the supplier. But there's a, a vendor supplier contractor relationship between the um, auditing entity, in this case the bank, and the audited entity, in this case the, the supplier. 
Now, I also think that it's better to think of the accounting firms, for example, as second party auditors. They think of themselves as second party auditors when the accounting firms refer to third parties, people who are reading and relying on the uh, audits, which is the investing public or, or others. Um, but a lot of people refer to um, external audit where there's not a supplier sort of relationship. A lot of people refer to that as third party audit. And there's a lot of use of the term third party audit. A true third party audit to my mind is an entity that has no interest in the cost, outcome, or timeliness of the audit. They don't care how long it takes, they don't care what the results are, and they're not going to get paid one way or the other based upon uh, their, their audit results. So they can be as hard-assed as they want to be, and it's not going to affect their bread and butter, their bottom line. But you will see third-party audit applied a lot to all external audits, uh, whether it's done by uh, EY and KPMG, two of the four big four accounting firms, classic, in my mind, uh, second party auditor. Now, there's a lot of reasons to go to the third party, and I'll, let's keep using the term third party, although we mean second and third party here, external audit. There's a lot of reasons to go to this. Um, it clearly privatizes the enforcement function. Um, the regulated entity pays the cost of the audit. Uh, the bank hires the um, accounting firm, for example, or a, a publicly traded company hires the accounting firm. Uh, Stanford has some external audit done, I, I assume. Stanford pays the, the accounting firm that does the audit, um, which basically saves the government money and basically expands the reach of government regulators who otherwise have limited resources. This is widely used. There are many, many, many different kinds of programs, uh, government regulatory programs that involve third party auditors, not only financial accounting and not even primarily financial accounting, but um, lots of other sort of inspection based regimes where the inspection entity that the person doing the inspection is a private party, often hired by and the entity that's undergoing the, the inspection or the audit. And so then this sets up the problem that the government has to audit the auditors. Because how do you really trust the audit? So then there has to be a process of ensuring that the auditors are not uh, being captured or not otherwise um, uh, going easy on the regulated entities. Now, for cybersecurity, there is a robust marketplace of firms offering cybersecurity audits and assessments. Lots of them. This is just a list of a few of the frameworks. Um, the big four accounting firms all are seeing uh, cybersecurity assessment or auditing as a growth field. There are many other companies that have grown up in this field. There's ISO standards. There's NIST guidance on how to do uh, security control audits, etc. So there's a there's a field there, um, but there are problems. Um, some uh, economists uh, wrote a famous article in 2002 after the banking crisis, uh, why good accountants do bad audits. Uh, number one, of course, is attachment bias, which is you're paying me. Um, I want I'm not going to be too hard on you. The accounting firm uh, that is too hard on its clients word is going to get around and they're going to get hired. There's also approval bias, um, which is basically it's when you're presented with something, you're presented with here's our, here's our financial sheet, here's our cybersecurity plan, here's our whatever, our food safety control. Um, there's a funny kind of bias that makes it hard to sort of reject that, to say, oh no, we're going to think of what you're not doing. And this problem of if I go easy on you, maybe nothing bad will happen. So the 
it's sort of like, if I go hard on you, I know I'm not going to get hired again. So the immediate consequences of a harsh audit are, I may lose my business, uh, I, the auditor. The immediate consequences of a soft audit, they're not there. Maybe the breach will occur, maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be on something that you found. Maybe it'll be something that you, in fact, missed yourself. So there's lots of reasons why um, audits uh, are problematic. And there's major fails. Uh, Enron, the most famous one in many cases, was basically running almost a Ponzi scheme. Energy, um, they were audited year after year after year by Arthur Anderson, got a clean bill of health, and in fact, completely um, collapsed. Um, uh, uh, um, one of the major uh, credit agencies, Equifax, had a major uh, breach just two months after it had been audited and received a clean bill of health. Um, uh, Target, major breach, uh, soon after it had been audited and certified as meeting the security standards of the payment card industry. And Twitter, part of the against Twitter was um, you shall undergo an initial and then every two year biennial assessment by an independent third party professional. Twitter will hire. So again, I, I would not have used the word third party there, but that, that's what most people refer to this as. There's even a study, this was on internal audits, not external audits, but finding that use of internal audits did not result uh, in uh, the probability of successful cyber attack. So very, very mixed record there, or one could say um, not much evidence about um, the value of audits. Although I do think that the way to think about an audit is what is the dialogue between the auditor and the audited entity? And how can that sort of back and forth actually bring the company closer to compliance, even in the course of the audit? It may end up with a good audit but, or a good assessment. And really, you get this sort of dialogue where this third party outsider is bringing to bear some new insights. So it's not that it's absolutely inappropriate, but clearly it, it has major, suffered major fails. Looking at the literature on this, you find that enforcement by third party audit works best when standards are objective and measurable, poor fit in situations of ambiguity. Unfortunately, we have a lot of ambiguity in the cyber security world. The standards are not clear. They're not um, measurable. Um, and particularly where you have performance, what complained to be performance-based systems saying, do this. And I love this quote from Jacob Horn um, that, you know, if where, where you only describe the outcome, just think of if, if it were a recipe, uh, here's your outcome, we're not going to tell you how to get there, um, decide yourself. Uh, that's a very, very hard thing to comply with and a very hard thing to measure. And again, the bottom line, regulatory agencies must audit the auditors. Now, the fourth, me uh, third method that I want to talk about, and the one where I think we need to go, not solely, but as part of the mix, is we are going to have to have, in my view, putting my cards on the table here, with critical infrastructure, telecoms, electric um, energy, um, airlines, um, water, um, uh, major critical infrastructures, we are going to need more government inspection. Now, it turns out that government inspection is actually the norm in regulatory enforcement across the board outside of the cybersecurity field. I went back, you know, uh, George, um, no, George, not Georgetown, Jamestown was right, 1607. By 1619, they had already established a system of tobacco inspection. Tobacco was obviously the, the, the foundation, uh, slave based obviously, but the foundation of um, uh, economy in Virginia. And, um, 
of government inspection of tobacco was established in Virginia. The states actually started before the Civil War establishing bank inspection systems. And then in 1864, concerned about fraud and uh, corruption around the massive buildup in the federal spending associated with the Civil War, the Office of Control of the Currency was established. 1902 was the initial Food and Drug Act. 1933, regulation of the stock exchanges. Uh, 1970, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Environmental Protection Agency, et cetera. So across a wide range of regulated sectors, we have government uh, inspectors uh, going out and uh, measuring, enforcing um, regulatory standards. Now, throughout this entire field, it is actually remarkable Broadly, uh, sort of government ad law policy and sort of how do you a scheme, it's actually remarkable how little concrete data there is. Um, not a lot, management based uh, regulation has been sort of the mantra of administrations for at least 20 or 30 years. Um, and these various uh, regulatory methods, not well surveyed. Not well studied. There was a fascinating study on bank supervision uh, a couple of years ago. It happened that uh, in the system of bank regulators, which we have, and bank inspectors, which is quite extensive now, um, one office closed down. <laughs> and for a while, there was confusion about what office was going to regulate the banks in one or more states. And so those banks didn't get inspected for a period of time. And then when that was sorted out, it, 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 somebody went in and did a study. So it was a natural experiment, basically, that because of this confusion about the shutting down of one of the regional offices. It was a fascinating natural experiment. And uh, researchers at the Federal Reserve Board uh, went and did a study of that and found that as soon as the supervisor stopped showing risky, uh, typo, risky investments at the banks went up. And the length of time it took to close uh, down insolvent institutions expanded, and the two of these things put together resulted in increased cost borne by taxpayers because we're taking on riskier investments, we're engaging in risky behavior for a longer period of time, raising the cost when it ultimately came to light that they were insolvent, uh, raising the cost of the recovery, which is borne by the taxpayers. So a nice natural experience that supervisors actually make a difference. This is already widely, not widely, um, it is widely deployed outside the uh, cybersecurity field. It is already deployed in some respects in the cybersecurity context. Those bank regulators now routinely check the cybersecurity controls of regulated financial uh, institutions. Uh, There's a fascinating example of uh, regulation and inspection of uh, bulk electric power uh, facilities. Workforce is a major challenge, no doubt. Will the government be able to hire um, adequate re uh, supervisors, monitors? There's obviously a cybersecurity workforce deficit overall uh, faced by both the sector as well as the government. So workforce is going to be a major challenge. But when you think of it, um, in 1864, Office of Controller of Currency was created. Uh, there was not a ready pool of bank examiners that over time. Uh, same for regulation of the securities exchange, same for uh, environmental regulation, etc. And I think that you have to admit that government inspection has some of the same challenges as third party audits. I think you still do have an approval bias. You may even have an attachment. Uh, bias, even though the person is regulated by the government, there's sort of a, maybe a likability bias there. And ambiguity remains an issue, that if the cybersecurity rules are not clear enough, the inspector may have, even if they are truly independent, truly third party, may have a hard time um, uh, figuring out, is this entity in front of me compliant or not? I think um, three thoughts, and again, this is sort of work in progress. I, I, I still want to dig deeper into 
these different methods and when they work and when they don't work and to try to come up with some kind of a matrix that says for this type of regulation, third party audits, third party audits works. For this type of regulation, self-certification may be appropriate. For this type of requirement, you need uh, a, a truly independent government, uh, large government inspector. Um, layered defense, everybody talks about layered defense. I think it requires layered enforcement. There's no one type of enforcement that's going to work everywhere. And I think we need to approach this, we, the, the nation, the government, makers, um, those of us thinking and writing about this, need to approach this with an attitude of experimentation that we don't know. And we have to admit we don't know. There's unfortunately very little tolerance of government saying we don't know or we're not sure or we're trying something and we don't know whether it's going to work. But I think that has to be how we approach this. And that has to be linked to data analysis. We have to collect more data. Uh, Andy has argued, others have argued that we need a Bureau of Cyber Statistics within the government to start studying uh, failures, to start flaws, to start studying uh, controls, uh, defensive measures, what works and what doesn't. Um, so that's where I am as of now. Anybody who wants to see the paper in draft, it's not an academic paper. I publish on Lawfare. It's a policy-oriented paper. Um, so it's like nine pages long. Um, but anybody who wants to see it, uh, write me, uh, jdemps at stanford.edu. I'll send you the paper. I'd love comments on it, suggestions. Um, well, thanks, Jim. Um, so I, I want to... Um before opening it up uh, to uh, Q&A from you all, um, I wanted to just offer a couple couple thoughts on the paper. I think in many ways, the, 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 there's a, a trade-off between uh, trying to enforce um, uh, rules um, after harm has occurred, where you know, a, 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 a violation of some sort is evident, uh, versus um, trying to enforce compliance with rules before uh, harm has occurred, right? Where, so in the, in the, in the first case, right, you know, there's an accident, something bad happens, um, versus um, there's, you know, to take your, your, your automobile example, right? There's an auto, a car manufacturer that hasn't put the right brakes in. Um, what, what, where's the appropriate, um, you know, enforcement insertion point there? And I think, it depends a lot, I think, on the nature of the harm, right? So, you know, for harms that um, are especially bad, say loss of life, limb, uh, harms that aren't reversible in some way or compensable in some way, maybe, you know, there, you know, we, we, we want to focus on trying to pre prevent harms from happening in the first place, which would put, put us in, in, in that sort of latter category of enforcement before there's demonstrable harm, right? The idea is to prevent harms from happening. Other cases, maybe, um, you know, you wait for the harm to happen, um, and assuming that, um, you know, that, that, that the, uh, the, the victims um, have the ability to bring suit, um, have, the, have the resources and, 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 and the, the, the right sort of economic incentives to, to, to enforce their claims, then you know, maybe, that's, maybe, maybe that's the right approach. Um, just, I just offer that as, a, as an observation. Well, I think that's, that's a good point. And, you know, I um, deprecated the after-the-fact approach. And it's not syst systematic. It's always sort of two years behind because you're in, in 2011, you're issuing an order related to an event that occurred in 2009. But on the other hand, as you say, we do in many ways uh, value the case-by-case -case approach. I mean, we, we like the fact that judges uh, only look at the case in front of them. They've got concrete facts. It's not speculative. You, you, you know sort of what ground, you can try to determine what was ground truth. So yeah, I think, I think we need that as part of the picture. And as you say, it has the ability to then uh, co compensate harm, um, it, it gives voice to victims in many cases so that you, you feel like, okay, I was heard, I, I, I got redress. So there's a lot to be said, even in the cybersecurity world, I think, for case by case, post hoc enforcement. Yeah, I think the other, the other um, another point I'll add is, 
a lot of the challenge in the category of trying to uh, enforce rules before harm has happened, a lot of those challenges have to do with, with information asymmetries, yep. where, where you know, one party has more or better information than, than another party. And so whether it's um, you know, a consumer or you know, whether that's a you know, consumer of electricity, whether that's a, an investor, um, not having the same information as the you know electric electricity company or the bank, um, and 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 you know, uh, but that also exists with the government too, right? right? Where you know a big challenge facing the government when it comes to enforcing rules is that the regulated entities have more information about their behavior than the government does. And your 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 thoughts on yeah. on, on government inspection as sort of an antidote to that, right. um, I think, are, are are aimed at you know seem aimed at that information asymmetry problem. Yep. Um, I, you know, I, I have a lot more to say, but I, I want to make sure that, um, that, that we leave lots of time for questions and answers. Um, I want to ask, uh, students get priority, so uh, if you're a student um, or postdoc uh, at, here at Stanford, um, I, I will give you first dibs on questions. So let's use this. Good. Andy, repeat the question when you're done. Yeah, I will. So uh, and I'll repeat the question just, just so people on, 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 uh, in the virtual world have it. Correct me if I don't get your question right. Uh, the question is um, how uh, your framework might apply to uh, particularly social media platforms that are collecting data on individuals. So, you know, it's the most work that we've done so far, by and large, on cybersecurity has been done by the FTC in the context of collection of personal information. So just to be clear, one thing I'm arguing for, and I, one thing I think that there's broad agreement on, at least within uh, the current administration, is that we need to be equally, if not even more, attentive to the critical infrastructures where the issue is not privacy, the issue is not personal data, but it's the availability of electricity and water and telecoms and all these other critical infrastructures where the issue is not the personal information. Okay, so just to set the stage. In terms of personal information, you know, one of the most important rules is don't collect it in the first place um, because whatever you collect is, is going to be vulnerable. Now, I mean, we could talk forever about the, pri the sort of missteps in the privacy field. Um, one of the missteps, in my opinion, in the privacy field has been this uh, monomaniacal emphasis on notice and consent. And the trouble with that, of course, is, is we all consent all the time to all this collection because we want the, the product or the service or the whatever it is we're uh, subscribing to or utilizing. And so entities, by and large, have not been encouraged or required to limit their data collection and retention in the first place. Um, certainly from the perspective of fair information practices, that data minimization is a core fair information practice, and it ties directly to the security obligation. But we haven't really enforced that or given adequate attention to it, in, in my opinion. Beyond that, again, I think we do have a relatively clear sense of what needs to be done in terms of um, user authentication, um, access controls at the corporate, on the corporate side, um, encryption, um, patch management, and vulnerability management, et cetera. So, you know, I think I almost feel like on the privacy side, which you might think of as information technology, we have a more robust set of understanding of what is required. I think where we're more deficient is on the what's called the OT side, or operational technology, which is related to critical infrastructure. And it wasn't until really after the Colonial Pipeline incident that the word operational technology even started coming into widespread use in government policymaking. It had all been focused on information processing, information technology, and largely the protection of personal information. Not so much the focus on protection of 
the availability and reliability of operations. I mean, Thank you. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, that's right. Go, to, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering about, um, you keep bringing up kind of examples of this kind of creative reappropriation of kind of old laws, basically for purposes of the, the False Claims Act and the, the FTC's use of this old like fraudulent and deceptive terms. Um, so is this kind of reappropriation, creative reappropriation of ancient laws unique to the cyber? law field, or is it a general feature of, of American kind of legislation, and is that a new phenomenon because the legislative branch is more paralyzed than it used to be? Do you want to restate the question? Yeah, so the question is um, whether uh, this, um, you know, this, this reluctance to legislate uh, is a new phenomenon, and uh, which, you know, gives rise to the, the, the reapplication of older, uh, you know, kind of pre-digital yeah. laws uh, yeah. to deal with digital problems. I think it is relatively unique to the sort of tech space, um, partly driven by um, just uh, congressional gridlock, uh, partly driven by the feeling that we've got this rapidly developing technology and we don't want to stifle innovation. Certainly the American sort of approach a little bit in contradistinction to a European approach, but the American approach has been, let's not regulate because that will stifle innovation. Um, so you do see this um, repurposing. Now I have argued that if you look at the Federal Communications Commission, um, the Center on Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, the FDA, I argued that the FDA, which after all, since it's for, for decades, has had authority to regulate the safety of medical devices, uh, the FCC, the authority to regulate the reliability of the communications infrastructure, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the authority to regulate the safety and efficient operation of hospitals and other healthcare facilities that receive Medicare and Medicaid payments. I've argued for a long time that all of them already have cybersecurity regulatory authority in their existing statutes. But this, uh, which is what the TSA did right after the Colonial Pipeline, because that statute does not contain the word cybersecurity, but it does say that the Transportation Security Administration has the authority to regulate the safety or the reliability of pipelines. And they have very, very detailed rules on the safety of pipelines. The, the federal, uh, there's a federal railroad uh, safety or regulatory body that regulates switching on railroads but by switching they mean mechanical or electromechanical switches not digital switching but i think their authority is there so until congress acts i think and, and by the way i do not think andy i assume you agree with me but i'd be curious if you don't i don't think and partly it's just my pragmatism here i think that we need, want, or will ever have a comprehensive critical infrastructure regulatory law. That it's gonna have to be sector by sector. It's gonna have to go through the pre-existing agencies. Some taking existing authority, some like the FDA coming forward and saying, well, maybe we have it, maybe we don't, but Congress, it would really help us if you were explicit. Uh, and put the word cybersecurity into our basic organic statute. I think we're going to have a mix going forward. I think some agencies will, in fact, exercise existing powers. Others, I think we will see them come forward and say, oh, yeah, where it says safety and reliability, you know, we call this a cut and bite amendment. Add comma, including cybersecurity, you know, comma, and you're there. 
I think, yeah, and on that approach, I think the risk is that, you know, now, you know, if it doesn't say cybersecurity, does that imply that, this is, this is Jim and I putting our lawyer hats yeah, on Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. You know, if it doesn't say cybersecurity, does that mean exactly. that when it's not mentioned explicitly, it's not included? Yeah. We're, we're, I think we're going to have a similar issue when it comes to AI and ML systems yeah, in the future yep. where, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're already sort of treating it as its own kind of vertical, even though it is, at the end of the day, a, a digital technology. Yep. I, I'll add to, to Jim's um, answer to your question. Yeah, it feels like there's also a, a like a legal cultural difference here as well. I mean, the U.S. is a common law system where, um, you know, for centuries, um, the, the prevailing approach, and I think you still see this reflected in American legal culture, is to proceed on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Be reactive. I mentioned earlier this distinction between regulating, uh, enforcing rules after harm has occurred versus trying to, you know, catch rule violations regardless of whether a harm has occurred yet. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a very common law way of, of I think, of, of, of approaching um, regulatory policy. And that's, that's what happens here in yeah. cybersecurity, which is yeah. negligence, which is a 300, 500, 600 year old legal concept. Um, all of that private litigation is largely based upon the theory of negligence, which is if you collect someone's personal data, you must protect it reasonably, which is the negligence standard in the United States. And, all of this litigation has proceeded based upon a common law doctrine that, you know, goes back to, you know, jolly old England. Yeah, and, and civil law systems like, you know, originating out of, out of, you know, really French law, but, you know, now across Europe and, and, and um, you know, is, is, is systems building, right? It's, it's, it's trying to build a comprehensive legal framework for a particular problem, which right. is why I think you see a strong tendency, you know, in, in Europe, even in other jurisdictions like China that, that have a civil law tradition of, you know, taking a problem and, and building a distinct, uh, bespoke, purpose-built sort of legal system. Uh, systematic, yeah. covering all four corners of the problem, yeah. Yeah, so any, any other questions? Go ahead. You know, that's, so the question is, um, how can you um, uh, address the biases that exist in an auditing system? And Jim, uh, before you get into the answer, we're, we're at time, so can, okay. can, can you give us about a minute of an answer, I'll and then I'll, I'll wrap us up. And the answer, so my, my answer is, I need to learn more about that, okay? Um, and that's sort of where I want to go next with some of this research. And anybody who has any thoughts on how that has worked, talk to me afterwards, please, because I, I want to know more about that. But that's exactly one of the areas where we need to go, which is to say, okay, take our understanding now of human psychology and, you know, all that great work around different unconscious biases, and how can we, you know, build the system of checks and balances that moderate, at least mitigate those risks. Well, Thanks that, all. Uh, We're going to call it, but definitely see me right afterwards, okay? Great. Well, th thank you, Jim. Please join me in thanking uh, Jim uh, for joining us today. Great job. Uh, thank you all for joining online. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to the questions online. Um, uh, just uh, to preview what's coming next week, uh, we have Alexandra Siegel here uh, with host Nate Persley. Hope to see you then.